stereo It beats for you, so listen close Hear my thoughts in every note If I was just another dusty record on the shelf Would you blow me off and play me like everybody else? If I asked you to scratch my back, could you manage that? Like if we had chicken travy, I can handle that Furthermore, I apologize for any skipping tracks This is the last girl to play me left a couple cracks I used to, used to, used to, used to, now I'm over that Cause holding grudges over love is ancient artifacts If I could only find a note to make you understand I sing a song an old school 50 pound boom box would you hold me on your shoulder wherever you walk would you turn my volume up in front of the cops and crank it higher every time they told you to stop and all i ask is that you don't get mad at me when you have to purchase mad d batteries appreciate every mixtape your friends make you never know we come and go like on the interstate i think i finally found a note to make you understand if you can hear this sing along and take me by the hand just keep me stuck inside your head like you And this is CS50. 77% of the people around you here in this room have no prior experience. And that was the same way last year with your 494 predecessors, all of whom accomplished the sorts of things that you saw depicted in those screens there. There's a lot of misconceptions about computer science that it is uh, dominated by folks with their heads down at computer terminals, toiling away, completely antisocial uh, reputation that it is dominated by men and not so much women. And yet these are things that are changing. In fact, last year alone, we had a record number of women in Computer Science 50, up to 37%, almost 40. And I don't doubt before long that we will be at 50-50, perhaps even this year here too. And realize too, that if you're thinking, what the hell am I doing in a computer science class? Class, realize that same emotion is probably going on in maybe 77% of the people to your left or to your right today. But indeed, 
There's a whole gamut of comfort levels that we have in this course, and these are statistics that are consistent throughout the years. Last year, 46% of the students in this course declared themselves as being among those less comfortable. There's no precise definition for that, but you kind of know it if you're in that bucket, and perhaps some of you have already just slapped that label on yourselves. We have last year 42% of the students in the class being somewhere in between less comfortable and more comfortable, with 12% of the class being those types who may very well. Have been programming since they were 10 years old or who took AP Computer Science, but we have all sorts of demographics in the class. And as you'll see today and on Friday, there are a number of ways in which all students in this class can approach it and ultimately succeed, as in that imagery there. And in no small part, that's because of the sheer size of the teaching staff this course has. Seated in front of you are only those TFs and CAs who are skipping classes right now, uh, but indeed, we have some 87 teaching fellows. And course assistants on staff, many of whom you will meet over the course of the semester. Now, what is computer science? We've started this class in recent years with a little demo involving tearing a phone book, and you might have heard about this sort of thing before. And it's a little hard to keep doing the same bit, even though it might very well send a very compelling, we think, pedagogical message. But I found a huge stack of phone books in Maxwell Dork in the computer science building this year. So I thought we might as well do justice to last year's phone book by actually having some of our own team members here answer a question of this form. So a phone book of this size has you know, some 1,000 pages in it. And this is a fairly tedious problem to solve if you're looking for something very small, a needle in a haystack, so to speak. And so if you're looking for, let's suppose these are not so much yellow pages, but white pages with people's names in them, someone like Mike Smith. Well, you could certainly start at the beginning and turn to the next page, and you could see that you're on the A's. You can see that you're on the B's and the C's and the so forth. And my God, some 600, 700 pages later, we might happen across Mike Smith. But if we could perhaps have about every third TF and CA here stand up, perhaps we can do something a little more compelling than that and send home the first such message of the day as to what it actually means to do computer science and to solve problems, as we say in the course catalog description, more efficiently and more effectively. Those TFs and CA's who now have handbooks, uh, phone books in their hands, if you could please stand up and let's see if we can have the audience here too answer a bit of a, here we are, uh, let's see if you want to just keep passing these down, otherwise this is going to take all day. Why don't we have each of these guys solve this in what's probably a much more intuitive way. I'll hang on to one for myself. And of course, anyone from the audience probably now can point out that my algorithm, my procedure that I proposed a moment ago, starting at the beginning and turning to the right, turning to the right, might very well be correct. And indeed, it is correct, but it's kind of stupid, right? Because clearly, we can do better than this. So anyone in the audience, what would a reasonable human being do to find Mike Smith in a phone book of this size? So tear, <laughs> tear it in half. <laughs> so we'll get there. <laughs> so you look roughly in the middle, right? You sort of haphazardly pull it on into the inside. So if our volunteers here standing with phone books could do exactly that, odds are, Matt, you ended up at what letter in the alphabet? M. M, indeed, which makes sense because it's roughly in the middle of the alphabet. And so Mike Smith is now clearly to the right. So perhaps our TFs and CAs could demonstrate exactly how we can chop this problem in half now. <laughs> <laughs> most, perhaps most of our staff can demonstrate this. <laughs> So now we've got a problem that's half as big, right? Now we have the M's through the Z's, and so we might dive in again. And so the staff might split the phone book in two yet again. And now we've gone from 1,000 pages to 500. We're about to go now instead to 250. So if you'd like to iterate again here and tear. So now we're down to just 250 pages. And if you guys want to repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat, after just a few tearings of this, only around 10, in fact, should they finally reach just a single page. And on that page should ideally, if they were paying attention to the pages that they were tearing, be someone. <laughs> and I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> Would be Mike Smith. Thank <laughs> you. 
So thanks to our team here, these are just a few of the faces you'll meet over the course of the semester. Um, you're welcome to sit here the entire lecture, that's fine, um, but in the moment we'll need just two of our team. Um, so what did this really do for us? Well, we went from a problem of size, again, 1,000, down to a problem of size 500 to 250. And this is a very powerful thing. We're not just taking one page at a time, but rather we're taking huge, non-trivial bytes of this problem out at any given time. So what does this actually mean? Well, let's consider another example. And let me zoom, whoops, let me zoom ahead to an algorithm here so that we can get the juices flowing among the audience here as well. So every year it's a real pain to do attendance in a room of this size and it would take me forever. Much like it would take me forever to find Mike in this phone book, I could start sort of like your grade school teacher would and do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and finally we get up to n, the total number of students in the room. Now what's a modification to that algorithm that you probably learned, say, in middle school or in high school? How could we speed up that algorithm very easily, very mindlessly? Yeah, count by twos, right? Instead of doing one, two, three, I'm pretty good at counting even numbers, so I can do two, four, six, eight, and so forth. And so if we were to plot this just very simply on a chart, if I said that my original algorithm was just counting one at a time and there's n students in the room, well, that algorithm's going to take n steps, n seconds, n minutes, n operations, whatever the unit of measure is. But if I start counting in twos, well, I can double the speed of this algorithm, and that's pretty good, but my god, it feels like there's room for opportunity here at the right hand side. And though I'm jumping around and spoiling some of the imagery, let's see if we can't paint this picture as a group as to how much faster we can count everyone in this room than I could. So if you would humor us, the staff of 50, if everyone in this room could now stand up and think to yourself the number one. Go ahead now and execute step two. Pair off with someone near you, add your numbers together, and just one of you should sit down. Do we know what the total is, roughly? Do we know what the total is, roughly? Uh, I got, I got 148. Uh, she never should have it. Where are the other two? Oh, uh, I don't know. Can you try to figure it out in the next 30 seconds? OK. So those still sh standing should continue pairing off. And we see just a few folks still standing. It's at this point where the demonstration starts to get a little awkward. It's either the people get far away or the arithmetic gets difficult. How many folks do we still see, have standing? I see one, two at, at the top, three, two, you two up to top can pair up. You three up top can pair off. Anyone else down here still standing? You two? What, what's your number here? 52 plus, 52 plus 91, and what do we have in the uh, balcony? 119 total, or just you? One seventy-two. Anyone else still standing? Oh, okay, yeah. One fifty-nine. Uh oh. I didn't hit plus. Now we're up to 17,000. <laughs> Anyone else? I'm going to fake the rest of this. 45, which puts us at 18,000. <laughs> and the total should indeed be, did our teaching staff come? 570. 570. So plus, wait, plus? 121? Okay. So the, the preface for this demonstration historically is that 
this algorithm tends not to work so well in reality. But the, if you consider it on a theoretical level, how much faster that could, how much faster that should have gone, well, indeed, if I were still counting like this and there were, let's say, 500 people in this room, my hand would have had to point at 500 people individually, or better yet, maybe 250 total iterations. But how about you all here? There's 500 people in the room, but on every iteration of this algorithm, this procedure, this program, call it whatever you want, half of you are sitting down. So it's much like the same phone book example, 500, 250, 125, and so forth. And so that begs the question, how many times can you divide a room full of 500 people in half? Well, feels like it's only around 9. If you do out the math and you kind of ignore rounding errors and so forth, you'll get down to a single, lonely, awkward volunteer standing in the middle of the room, ideally containing that number. And I simply facilitated here by merging some of these numbers to get together. And that's a powerful thing, because if we go back now to where we started, counting sort of like in grade school, and then we upgraded to twosies in middle school, but now we have something fundamentally more powerful, and that's this notion of logarithmic growth, as opposed to something linear. Linear implying the straight lines there, logarithmic. This is sort of the end game when trying to implement something well. And that will be a theme of this course. Not just getting something to work, because right, I could find Mike Smith the old-fashioned way, but it's not slow. It's not efficient. I'm going to go use some other website. I'm going to go use some other program that performs better and solves problems more efficiently for me. Well, the other thing about computers is that they're not all that uh, Actually, I did have one snippet here. Let me pull this back. Wimbledon. So you might be familiar with the notion of uh, tennis and these tournaments that happen each year. And in Wimbledon, we have some, what is it, 128 people participating in a given tournament. And that tournament actually goes fairly rapidly because when you're playing tennis, of course, you're playing against another person. And so every time a game is played, and if you're assuming single elimination, you get to have and have and have and have the number of players participating until you have, ideally, just one winner at the end of the game. But imagine now how we can apply this idea of divide and conquer, taking a problem and splitting it in half, and then in half, and then in half, whereby we're not doing anything new and different each time. We're doing the same darn thing again and again, but the problem is rapidly approaching the solution, just one. So I looked it up on Wikipedia earlier today, and there's about 7 billion people on Earth right now. Well, you know what's a pretty powerful thing? We could actually have a worldwide tennis tournament where all 7 billion, maybe let's even round up to 8 billion people, could participate. And how many rounds would that actually take? Well, how many times can you divide roughly 8 billion people in half? Well, you go from 8 to 4, 4 to 2, 2 to 1, 1 to a half billion, and so forth. Well, you know what? We could knock off this global Wimbledon tournament after just 33 rounds of play. Now, admittedly, we'd need a whole lot of tennis courts to be doing this all in parallel and simultaneously. But that's the power of actually thinking through and coming up with algorithms that are much more uh, elegant and efficient than what might otherwise be obvious. The problem, though, is that computers need to be told what to do. And we've all gotten frustrated by computers when they don't behave as expected. And that's usually not even your fault, but the fault of some programmer who made some mistake, who didn't anticipate some condition or made some assumptions that the user then kind of flaunted. Well, what's an example? Well, if you look up most any cooking book, well, a cooking book will typically start with a recipe in step one, something like put egg in bowl. Well, here's a bowl, here's an egg. It's kind of assuming a few things. That's not, in fact, what the author intended. So we need to be more precise, right? We need to make, we cannot make so many assumptions. If we want the computer, if we want the cook to do what we want him or her to do, we need to be more accurate. And we need to think about how best to express those things. Now, you've probably not had the fun of filling out your own tax forms. But by contrast, the world of federal taxes is very much the opposite. You get these crazy worksheets that are now available in PDF form, or you can use software like Turbo tax and the like. But if you just glance at this sort of thing, you'll see that it's ever so precise. For instance, it asks you to check a box and input a number in row 5, in row 6, in row 7. And then it explicitly says in row 9, add lines 5 through 8. In other words, the process of taxes is actually, though overwhelming, much more precise. It doesn't just say, add up what you earned this year and let us know. Right? It's much more precise than that. So perhaps we could do something like that along the lines of 
something more familiar and less daunting than taxes. In a moment, I'm going to go ahead and play some background music. And let me ask that you humor us here, too, by pulling out a sheet of paper and writing in no more than one, maybe two minutes, an algorithm, a set of, a set of procedures, some number of steps, line by line, with which you could instruct a computer or a human or just a friend. To make you a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and assume only that you have a jar of peanut butter, a jar of jelly, a loaf of bread, and a knife. You have those as your ingredients. And so, if you would, take just one minute or two to write out this algorithm, and we'll see how well we have done. At least once more. Iteration. Finish what you're working on. I'm going to need a couple of volunteers. How about you two, lovely contestants? Come on up. And how about two folks who have not been prepped on the staff? Yes, I see two hands here. How about in red shirt here and some of, someone from this side? Someone from this side. More interest, more interest. Not seeing that. How about you with your hand the highest? There. Uh, right, yep, you two just turned around. Yeah, come on down. There will be ample opportunities during the remainder of the term. So now there's still an opportunity for some participation here. I need、um, two people's algorithms that they actually wrote down. All right? Better be good. Thank you. OK. Not going to get this back if that's OK. And one more volunteer. All right. All right. These will be very short demos. All right. So, we've got four of our volunteers here, only two of whom I actually know. So, let's see, your name is? I'm Daniel. Daniel, David. All right, this is Rob, Zamila, and Lisa. Lisa, David. All right, so I just so happened to go to the supermarket before this example, and this was actually inspired by my fifth grade teacher, who at the time, I'm pretty sure, did not intend this to be any sort of demonstration in the pedagogy of computer science and the,、uh, the ideas behind algorithms, but really just how to teach a、uh, 10 year old how to follow directions. Well, let's see if we can't, though, borrow the same spirit of this, since I、uh, was well equipped here to go and、uh, pick up some loaves of bread. So, we've got、uh, some bread. For each of you. All right. We've got、uh, some jelly here and a knife, as promised. We've got、uh, knives for each of you. And lastly, the final ingredients with which to see how well these algorithms performed. All right, 
So let's see how our two volunteers here did. So I'll go ahead and be the advisor. You all should be behaving in exactly the same manner that a computer or a robot, let's say, would actually interpret these as making no <laughs> assumptions. All right. Step one, go to the Annenberg lunch table. <laughs> okay. All right, let's try, let's start with the other one and see where this gets us. So step one here is take two slices of bread from the loaf. Incidentally, should have said this before, you have to be comfortable appearing on camera and on the internet as we do this. <laughs> okay. All right, step two apply two uh, tablespoons of jelly on both halves. <laughs> Apply two tablespoons of peanut butter in the same way. Step four, join the two halves. <laughs> and step five, perhaps coupled with a round of applause, have fun. <laughs> Thank you very much to our volunteers. Um, the, the sandwiches are yours. So <laughs> suffice it to say that there's room for improvement in something like this. And this might seem like a ridiculous visual, but the reality is when it comes time this semester to instruct a computer to do something, you'll be surprised just how often and how bad you are at that when you're doing this, most likely for the very first time. <laughs> when you're doing this for the very first time. And so among the lessons that will become ingrained over time, honestly, is truly how to think more carefully, how to think more precisely, and in turn, how to express yourself, if you can just take the tables with you, how to express yourself more methodically so that the person hearing your counsel, the person hearing and taking your instructions can actually implement them correctly. Now let's come back to this notion of uh, numbers and this notion of solving things more efficiently and this notion of dividing and conquering and really the notion of things taking more time or less time. <laughs> All attention is clearly focused right here, right now, isn't it? <laughs> um, okay. We have an algorithm too. No problem. <laughs> Very nice. All over the internet, this is now. <laughs> All right, thank you to the team. So consider this. Suppose you were asked, and let's pick a volunteer up front here, since you just caught my eye. So we can have this conversation right here. I will hand you a million dollars. I will write you a check right now for a million dollars. Or instead, you can have a penny today, but two pennies tomorrow, four pennies the next day, but just for a month. Which would you prefer? All right, so right, frankly, whenever asked in life to make a choice between something that sounds good and something that sounds stupid, take the stupid thing because there's probably a hidden lesson in there. And indeed, there is. If we consider this, oh, I just reneged, didn't I? So consider this. Actually, we did come prepared. Can't quite cover it today, but this will get me through the week, I think. <laughs> so 
Why do I suggest we can't quite cover that? Well, let me just open up something like Excel.、Uh, let me say now and just once that Excel is not computer science,、uh, but we'll use it simply because it's a nice way of just doing some numbers real quickly. So suppose that on day one, I were given a single penny, and on day two, I get twice as many, and then twice as many. Well, I can do a silly little Excel formula here where I just say times,、uh, times two, and then I can just repeat this. And repeat this, and repeat this, and repeat this. And this is getting tedious, so let me just highlight all the way up to say 31 days in a month and hit paste. And by the time I get up here, you might very well have made the right choice. In fact, just to make this point ever so clear, let's go up to formatting, this too, not computer science. Let's go to currency, OK, just so we can see this a bit more visually. And my God, you banked $10 million from that deal. So, Three weeks to go. <laughs> so it's quite extraordinary what happens. And what's the relationship here? Well, the actual math behind all of this and the actual thinking is actually the same. Whereas before we were dividing, 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 and dividing in half again and again. And that allowed us to solve something much faster than with some simple, if naive, approach. The implications are the same in reverse. If you actually do something foolishly, or in this case, without thinking, the cost can certainly pile up over time. And so one of the other themes in the course and in programming. More generally, is going to be about the amount of time it actually takes for your programs to solve problems. Every one of us has probably gotten angry at our computers at some point because of the stupid spinning beach ball or hourglass or something like that. That means it's thinking or doing something. Well, it's probably not doing it all that well. And once you get to the point of implementing the next Facebook or Google.com, you've got to be better than just linearly searching through all possible pages on the internet in order to find some search term of interest. To you. Well, this sort of works in, this,、uh, in a similar way, too. And I mentioned here Facebook. You're familiar with the notion of the six degrees of Kevin Bacon, perhaps, whereby you are probably connected to someone else via at least six friends. So I might be friends with Alice, Alice with Bob, Bob with Charlie, and so forth. And at some point, one of those people in that relationship is going to know Kevin Bacon, of all people. But what's the implication of that? Well, you can actually feel this all the more these days with Facebook and the like, because even if I imagine something quite simple, suppose I have just a hundred friends. Well, that's actually, in Facebook terms these days, actually relatively low, right? But we'll start at that particular point, and I'll see if I actually multiply, let's say,、uh, the previous cell up there by 100 again. The idea being, well, if I have 100 friends, Those friends, let's assume for simplicity, have 100 friends, and their friends of friends have 100 friends. How much does this blow up? Well, let's actually do this for six degrees up to six. And my God, by the time you get six degrees away, no wonder you know Kevin Bacon because you have a trillion people in your social network. Now, back in the day, a few years ago, when Facebook belong,、uh, began only at Harvard and was initially only available to Harvard students and then nearby universities, they actually had a neat feature where they would show you a graph, a visualization of your friends and your friends of friends, and then they ripped that out and removed it all together. And at best these days, maybe you have some kind of relationship with friends of friends because to actually Transitively continue this out. I mean, my God, you end up knowing everyone on Facebook and more people than there actually are、uh, in the world at this point. And so these numbers start to build up both upwardly and downwardly. Well, along those lines, Let me tease you with this. So, we have a lot of friends at Facebook, being that it did in fact have its origins here. And I thought I would tease you with a little image here. What we thought we would do this year is invite some of our friends from Facebook back to campus, some of、uh, CS50 TFs, no less, to help us explore. Some things like this. I won't leave this on the screen for too long. It will be in a PDF online on the course's website if you'd like to noodle through it、uh, further. But this is an example of a puzzle. And it's hopefully non obvious. And this, too, doesn't necessarily relate to computer science per se, but more generally to the solving of problems. And that really is what this course is about. Though we will use programming as a tool to solve problems, the course at the end of the day is about reasoning through, taking inputs, producing outputs, and figuring out the Solutions there too. Now, what's the relevance here? Well, our friends at Facebook have kindly offered to take us all out, or some subset of us, to dinner on Friday. More on that、uh, in a little while、uh, via email this week. But they'll also be joining us on Saturday. And if of interest to you, from roughly 12 to 3 p.m. this Saturday, will we have the first ever CS50、uh, 
uh, Puzzle Day sponsored by Facebook. If this is of interest to you, just go at some point today to cs50.net slash register. And the way in which this will work is you'll arrive, you'll be fed, you'll then be challenged with a handful of PDFs or printouts of seven pu pu、uh, puzzles similar in spirit to those, but each quite distinct, that somehow spell out a seven letter word that's in fact going to be a seven letter word on campus. And if you then go seek that out and do that quicker than everyone else, you will win some fabulous prizes. Among the First prizes for teams will be some $50 gift certificates, $25 gift certificates for the runners up. And for anyone who participates, will there be, on a raffle basis,、uh, a Wii、uh, given to anyone randomly who partakes, irrespective of performance in the puzzles? But so that this is inherently a social activity and not a whole bunch of individual people hunkered down solving puzzles on their own, you'll be required to bring at least one friend, ideally someone from outside this room, outside taking CS50 this year, but up to a maximum of four. Teammates. So, if you have some block group,、uh, blocking group friends or some link mates or the like with whom you would like to do this, we'll post more details on the course's homepage at cs50.net. But do take care to register because、uh, seats will be limited. And if you're interested in the idea of dining with me and some of the TFs and CAs this Friday night, go to cs50.net slash RSVP. And we will, if necessary, lottery things off. So, that you don't need to all be doing this now, especially since there's not so great Wi Fi in Sanders. We'll actually follow up via the website and randomize things as needed. So, more on that by Friday. So, speaking of Facebook, a number of you found your way here or to other classes today via this tool of ours, the course's own course shopping tool、uh, called Harvard Courses that lives at that URL there. So, this tool happens to be integrated with Facebook, which, to be honest, is remarkably easy、um, to do these days. And indeed, many of our own students do this toward terms e n d so that you no longer Have to implement the notion of registering for accounts and remembering yet another username and password. You can integrate with Facebook and any number of other providers like Google and use their own usernames and passwords without you yourself seeing them. Well, the upside of this too is that we too get to see network effects of shopping for courses, and hopefully you found it to be a little more efficient than more traditional approaches. Now, with that said,、uh, let me personally apologize to any of you using the tool between 8 p.m. and midnight last night. I was sitting down preparing for lecture and got an IM. From one of our TFs. OMG, Harvard Courses is down.、Uh, that then delayed the preparation for this lecture by about four hours while we responded to the sudden spike of interest the night before shopping,、uh, the night before classes began, and actually figuring out what courses you wanted to shop. But we thought we would share some fun facts. At the moment, this particular tool, if familiar with it, has some 2,500 Harvard undergraduates、uh, using it over the past week alone. The, notum, the total number of courses across your shopping lists collectively as of this morning at eight was about 25,000. Particularly fun was to see statistics like the average number of courses that your friends are shopping is actually only around seven, but this is highly variant.、Uh, this, again, is the average number of courses people are、eh, going to try to check out this week and next. The maximum this year, which broke last year's record, is in fact 125. <laughs> Now, you might think that's an outlier worthy of just dismissing, but rather the runner up was 123. So、uh, you are.、Uh In good company if you are that 125. But not to dwell too long on Facebook, but really to use it as a point of departure for just how applicable things like computer science and programming more generally are. Oh, and I did have one more fun fact I should probably share. So it turns out that if you look at the means by which people are using the embedded calendar, if using this tool, the most popular time to be、uh, busy is between 3 p.m. and 7 p.m., presumably because of sports and extracurriculars and the like. But I dare say、uh, we looked a little closer at the data, and the second most popular time to be busy is. <laughs> <laughs> No, no 9 or 8 a.m. classes, it seems, are of interest. So, what are some of the opportunities here? Well, besides doing things and building things that relate to the tools that you yourselves use, you can actually still make things that are just as. Say technological, and as you'll see over the semester, with relatively little complexity. The marginal return of spending just a few weeks and months in a course like this is that you learn how to build things that you take for granted as using these days, and you take for granted as being accessible to you in your pockets, but it's remarkable, as those images suggest, just how much your predecessors accomplished over the course of just three months. One of the tools we built out as a course for students to use before. 
the Harvard Courses tool was this one, a much simpler tool that simply took what traditionally was in PDF and paper form alone,、uh, the Harvard、uh, shuttle schedule, and allows you to look up things like, well, I'm in Mem Hall, I'd like to go to the quad, so I might click there and click here. And now you can see the next shuttles when they depart. Now, this is becoming underwhelming these days, but indeed, this was a huge improvement when the alternative was just paper. But you can do cool things too. And as we look ahead in this course to the final project, know that you'll be able to make things like this. If you don't mind, just have to make a quick call. I've got my thing plugged into、uh, the overhead here. This is the S50. For shuttle boy, press one to start over. Press nine. So I've pressed one. What is your origin for quad? Press one. Mather. Press two. Boylston. Press three. Lamont. Press four. Manhall. Press five. So hit five. To start over. Press zero. What is your destination for quad? Press Let's one. Let's go to the quad. Mather. Press two to start. The next shuttle leaves in seven minutes. That. 2 p.m. and then at 2 10 p.m. 2 20 p.m. and 2 30 p.m. So there's your exit strategy if you're getting bored already. Well, that number was 617 bug CS50. And what's exciting about this is not so much that, because frankly, you can use SMS, you can use a plastic piece of card to look up numbers more quickly than the phone might recite. But that service alone that CS50 uses for that, called CS50 Voice, is a tool you yourselves can use at semester's end if you would like to build tools that actually make outbound calls and, or receive inbound calls and respond to some input. And that's all possible thanks to this notion of what's Generally called an API, application programming interface. And these are been entering now even the,、uh, the public lexicon. To use an API generally means to use data or to use functionality that someone else has implemented so that you yourself can stand on their shoulders and integrate really helpful, really cool, really useful functionality into your own program without reinventing that wheel yourself. You can liken it to the act of building a house. You could go out and chop down trees, you could go out and melt glass. Glass and make windows, but what do you do instead? You go to a store, you go to Home Depot, you buy planks of wood, you buy sheets of glass, and you integrate those prefabricated components into your own work so that your contribution to the whole process is the final output and you care less about the, the underlying details of implementation. Well, let me go ahead in just a moment here and bring up our head teaching fellow, Matt Chartier, and also our other head, Rob Bowden, to say a quick hello. Rob, you'll recall, was the guy with the special loaf of bread earlier. You'll have to talk into my chest over here. If you guys. <laughs> Next, come over here. All right,、uh, always. Okay. <laughs> Less awkward.、Okay. <laughs> yeah, much better. Hello, everybody. My name is Matthew Chartier. I'm a senior in Kirkland House and a concentrator in computer science. I've also TFCS 50 for the last two years and I'm returning for this year,、uh, this time in the role of head TF. I'm very excited to be back with the course in this capacity this year to help David organize everything and to make a wonderful experience happen for all of you, just like the experience I was、uh, treated to freshman year coming in.、Uh, my role as head TF is essentially going to be a point of contact、uh, both between David and the rest of our teaching staff, but also between、uh, The TFs as a, an organization, as a staff, and all of you. So, if there are any p o i n t during the course where you have any issues that you, you don't really know who to reach out to,、uh, I'm the person you want to reach out to for that. Contact me、um, at heads at cs50.net. You can also re reach、uh, either David or Rob here at that address.、Uh, just talk a little about the course because I'm waxing nostalgic a bit now looking out over our first lecture for,、uh, I suppose, the last time and remembering when I came in freshman year and took CS50 for, for the first time. I came in without any prior experience. I had No formal training in CS. I maybe mucked around a little in a couple languages just because I was curious, but didn't really get anywhere with it. And、uh, coming into CS50 at the time, thinking about concentrating in something maybe like physics or government,、uh, I found a whole new world opened up to me.、Uh, I was exposed to exactly what computers could do and how powerful、uh, these simple programming languages, just typing statements in text files and making them do something, could really be, and how exciting it could be to work in that sort of environment and to really make things happen with these machines we, do every, we use every day.、Uh, I also found something else. This isn't just an intro course, it's sort of an experience and an institution. And if you don't think that yet, I assure you that by semester's end, you may have、uh, a new perspective for what exactly happens here. CS50 is one of those rare courses at Harvard College that is challenging, populous, elaborate, 
and fun enough to really create a sense of community amongst the entire course and to create something that's not only useful for you, but memorable. It's certainly been memorable for me, and I can't wait for one more ride with this great course, and I hope that you have the same experience. Thanks a lot, and I'll pass the mic off to Rob. I'm a Rob from Kirkland House. <laughs> I'm a junior, and uh, this is my second year TFing CS50. Uh, you know, we've really tried to make this course so that you don't really feel like you're doing work, you feel like you're having fun. Uh, you really get the sense of accomplishment when you finish a problem set. How often do you take a course where when you finish a problem set, you can show it to your roommate and they can play a game? Or you can give a URL to a friend back home and they can see what you've done. So like Matt, like Matt said, this course does have a culture and I just want to encourage you to really get into it because it's so much more fun that way. And especially for the largest chunk out of you out there who are less comfortable, uh, there's no reason to feel alone even if you get frustrated. We do have this staff of 87 people. We're all here to help you make this class the best it can be. So I hope you have a fun semester. Believe it or not, thank you both. Believe it or not, I started out life as a... Thank you. So for what it's worth, testament to just how fun this particular world can be. I started out life here as an undergraduate in 1995 and was heads down into the government department thinking I'd come in uh, having like things like history and con law in high school and such. And so I didn't really think about exploring a bit beyond my own comfort zone. And indeed, CS50 then, and to some extent still now, as well as computer science more generally, has this sort of daunting reputation that it's not so much for the uninitiated, but rather for those who've been doing it since since the beginning of their life. But that's indeed not the case. That 77% statistic has been quite consistent. And so it wasn't myself until sophomore year that I finally got up the nerve to actually take the course, but I took it past fail. I enrolled because I thought I'm on this track toward government, but I'm going to finally get up the nerve to actually dabble in this course. And long story short, just the end of that semester did I declare my concentration as CS, that I end up, my God, doing this here today for the same course I once took, but that's not to be clear, the goal in this course. Most of the students, about oh, just over half of the students that take 50, it is for them a terminal course and that they don't go on to take other courses in computer science. But they parlay those skills and the savvy they derive in a course like this back into the social sciences, the humanities, the physical sciences, where they have large data sets or large volumes of information that they need to analyze or process, or even in the more familiar world of running student groups. And you want to be able to send out a mass mailing to a thousand people. My God, doing it manually isn't so fun. If you're using a tool like Microsoft Word and Excel, so you can do better than that if you do it yourself and you have the savvy with which to do so. And that's ultimately, too, some of the takeaways of a course like this. So a hello here to CS50 as to what to expect. So in terms of expectations, they're fairly straightforward. Attending lectures and sections, submitting nine problem sets, taking two quizzes and a final project, the images of which are conveyed by the fair and hackathon alike. In terms of grades, this is one that's particularly uh, close to my heart. Um, I am not a fan, in general, of grades. I think they tend to do more harm than good. There is value in that they certainly help motivate, but that, of course, can be to a, a crippling degree. And so we've tried in recent years to send the message quite ardently to do what I myself did, to put that toe in the water and to explore what, for many of you, are indeed unfamiliar waters by taking it, if you so choose, pass-fail. You can do it letter grade or pass-fail. Uh, we go so far as to provide you with these pink uh, change of grading status uh, pass-fail forms at either end of the lecture hall, and I'm happy to sign study cards for which you might like to do that. Do ultimately consult the syllabus for some fine print as to what courses can and cannot count for concentration credit if you do take a pass-fail. But undoubtedly, if on the fence or a little bit nervous about putting that toe in the water, taking a course as I once did pass-fail, and then having the opportunity to change your mind up to the fifth Monday of the term is a wonderful way of kind of getting past that initial fear of failure, whether failure is an E or a B, but to actually give you that comfort to try something 
new.、Um, so, toward that end of sending the message, we actually have a tradition in the course of、uh, having cake、uh, in just a few minutes.、Uh, we decided we'd print and emblazon on each, cases,、uh, on each cakes the message we'd like you to take.、Uh, we have one in chocolate, one in vanilla, one with some vanilla in chocolate. Um, <laughs> maybe don't eat the fourth cake, but that one too、um, will await you before long. But what is the course ultimately about? It's mostly about the hands on aspects. In lectures, where we present concepts and ideas and try as best I can to get you excited and genuinely interested in some subject. But undoubtedly, the work and the experience in this course derives from your. Working on the problem sets. But know that so that the appeal to both those less comfortable and more comfortable alike, most of the problem sets we issue in two different editions, so to speak. A standard edition that's targeted at 90% of the students in the course, and then typically a hacker edition, which ultimately covers the same sorts of material but from a more sophisticated and more challenging perspective, asks you to do a bit more、uh, in terms of sophistication because those hacker editions assume more. So realize, too, that though I might I might focus verbally on this 77%. There is a non trivial number of 12% of the class that indeed have been programming since they were, say, six years old, or just took one course in AP Computer Science, or didn't even do that, but just kind of feel that they're ready for something new. So realize that there are these disparate tracks within the course、um, that appeal ideally to both. Moreover, does the course provide some number of late days that you can spend during the semester? Inevitably, life happens, and you need to, for instance, deal with some midterm or some other class's deadline. So realize you'll have. Some flexibility whereby you can spend late days on certain problem sets. And moreover, there's also the circumstances where just life really gets in the way and just a week doesn't go so well. And so ultimately, toward the end of the semester, at the end of the semester, will we drop your lowest score and again refer to the syllabus for any fine details? And where can you go? Well, in this black box here is CS50. And what's been exciting for me, having been here years ago, Um, studying the same subject is that this chart, this flow chart, whereby every arrow from CS50 means what course you could take right after CS50, for which 50 is the only prerequisite, you can go off in directions of、uh, more programming, or theory, or math, or graphics, or networking, or hardware. Or, with some bias, iPhone programming this spring, a new course that、uh, I myself will be teaching. And so,、uh, the only prereq for that in two will be 50. And so, this is too testament to just how much you can do. In that the marginal return of some knowledge and some savvy in this world of computer science is indeed quite empowering. Now, for those of you who might have shopped the course last year or heard from some friends、um, what's in the course, we like to introduce every year as many new and exciting things as possible. And so, for the first time this year, will we be transitioning away? From what historically was a very server side centralized architecture, where all CS50 students would run a program on their Mac or PC, it doesn't matter what OS you use,、uh, you would connect to some central server where software would await you there. Well, more fun these days, now that Uh, most everyone has、uh, particularly modern computers, is the ability for these computers, believe it or not, to run not just Mac OS or Windows as you currently are, but to run yet another operating system inside of a window on your own computer. And not this old school approach of like, having to reboot your computer and then it changes operating systems. Double click an icon and voila, you're running an operating system called Linux, which is what will happen to use.、Uh, but it will look the CS50 appliance in a window like just some other desktop. You'll have a little CS50 menu. Instead of a start menu in the bottom left hand corner, you'll be able to navigate through the very user friendly type tools that we'll introduce you to, all of which can be found in the real world. So, nothing here is just simulated for the purposes of academics in the course. You will be equipped throughout the semester with real world, sort of de facto standard tools that you'll use in your own fields, whether computer science, humanities, natural sciences, anytime. You need a computer to solve some problem.、Uh, we'll also, for those more familiar, perhaps for those more comfortable, introduce you to things like terminal windows and SSH, and we'll introduce you also to graphical editors with which to write code. And the odds are this looks completely cryptic right now. And indeed, if you're among that 77%, you might not have ever seen a program's source code, the thing that the human writes to make the computer do something. This is one of the simplest programs a human might write to just make the computer do something stupid, like say, hello world. On the screen. But this year, too, for the first time, will we also introduce, for those familiar, what's called an IDE, an integrated development environment, so that if at term's end you actually do want to be among those who goes off and interns at Microsoft or Google or Facebook or in, uh, uh, in Wall Street to actually use some coding skills, to apply them to some real world problems, know that this term, more so than ever, you will be very well equipped with what's out there. 
Another aspect that's changing this year for the first time is office hours. For 20 some odd years, office hours have gotten overwhelmed. And this is back when the course was smaller and when you would sign up for office hours, one on one assistance with the TFs and CAs by writing your name on a piece of paper that's tacked to the wall in the Science Center. Well, what we're going to do entirely now is reboot these. So if you've heard the reputation, which was quite true for some years, that office hours are slow and you end up waiting some amount of time, we're hoping, being computer scientists, that we can now fix this. So one, We are going to exit what was once a very magical, wonderful place to spend an evening,、um, but move ourselves from the basement of the Science Center and its fluorescent lights to, four,、uh, to dining halls on campus to coincide with Brain Break, where by this year's office hours will be Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays and Thursdays, 9 p.m. to midnight, whereby we'll have not just half a dozen or so TFs and CAs on duty at once, but 10 and 20 at a time. And we've coordinated with the masters of FOHO and Lowell and Leverett to supplement Brain Break so That there's plenty of food for you and the residents. But we can do better than that. What we will also have done, thanks to one of our TFs, Tommy McWilliam, over the summer, is We've implemented our own version of, say, the Apple Genius Bar tool.、Uh, for those of you who might own a Mac or have been to an Apple store, you know that there's this、uh, bar of geniuses that help you with your computer problems. And so rather now than have students working at these older work、uh, computer terminals in the basement of the Science Center, we'll all gather more socially, if you so choose to partake, with your laptops in the dining halls, working alongside your friends who are not even taking computer science, who are just there for some food or to write some、uh, PSET. But to raise your hand when you need help on problem sets this year, you'll instead not scribble your name on the board, but instead you'll log in to cs50.net. You'll raise your hand by telling us what are you working on and what's your question. And then you, like Harry, Ron, Hermione, Gilderoy, and others here, will appear on the staff screen so that we know who now has questions. And they're ranked in order of who raised their hand first, but also they're color coded. And you'll find that this tool. Uh, allows you to communicate to others in the D Hall what you're in fact working on. And you'll see, per the course's、uh, syllabus on academic honesty, which we'll discuss before long、um, in weeks to come, that you are allowed to collaborate and to discuss problem sets with friends so long as the line of, here's my code, why don't you take a look at it, is not crossed.、And、more on that in the time to come. But the hope here, too, is to make the experience of taking computer science and solving problems ever more sociable so that you actually do learn from each other and benefit in that way. Way. Now, meanwhile, much like the Apple Genius Bar has a greeter, so will we.、Uh, we know a little something about programming, or at least Tommy does, and so we've bought ourselves an iPad. And so, what you'll see at CS50 Office Hours this year is a greeter, so to speak, who isn't going to awkwardly say hello to you upon entry at Office Hours, but rather when you raise your hand virtually, he or she on the CS50 staff will see that, oh, Alice has a question, and then Bob on the right hand side of this same iPad app will the staff member see that Professor McGonagall and Sprout and Flick. Wick and Snape are currently on duty. The TFs and CAs were there waiting to help you one on one. We will tap Alice on the left and Snape on the right. Alice's computer screen, her own laptop, will flash a message up, will play a sound, and will communicate to Alice that it's her time with Professor Snape. So we thought we would completely overhaul office hours toward an end of providing you with the most support structure possible. What about lectures? Here we are today simply painting the trajectory for the semester. But joining us as well, albeit virtually, with these cameras in the room, are not only the Harvard Extension students who've been enrolled in the course for some time, but for the first time this year, will MBA students at HBS be allowed to take CS50 as an FAS course for credit? So, literally at this moment, we have, well, in 10 seconds, the HBS students will see me waving my hand because they're seated in a lecture hall across the river,、uh, taking now CS50, albeit from afar. Similarly, do we have students from Belmont High, Watertown High, taking the course? For the first time, so that they too can dive into a world that their own schools might not necessarily offer in the same form. And similarly, is this course available as what's called open courseware so that the entire world can indeed tune in, use the CS50 appliance, and learn at their own pace? So, what's in store for the next several weeks? Well, this week in particular, we will introduce some of the basics. The ideas of programming and computer science itself will focus in particular on a graphical language called Scratch. But more on that to come. Next week, we'll be diving into a language called C. It's the C language that I implemented that silly little Hello World program just a moment ago. And even though it really might look like Greek to you now, you very quickly, trust me, will acclimate to this environment. And those common mistakes you'll make initially, not quite typing the right commands, will very quickly become. 
old hat. In week two, will we transition to、uh, more domain specific topics? Not so much low level details, but how do we now use these skills to solve real world problems? We'll talk about cryptography and encryption, the, ar-、uh, the art of scrambling information so that things like your name and your social security number and credit cards are all entirely secure. The week after, we'll talk more about algorithms and these things called data structures. I actually intentionally picked an algorithm for counting students that doesn't require a huge amount of sophistication, just requires a whole lot of brains, a whole lot of CPUs to execute at once, but it was still pretty simple. But when you get to the point of implementing Facebook or Google or any tool that's popular on your computer, you need typically to、uh, muster more intelligent resources for it, and we'll introduce you with those、uh, particular tool sets. In week four, we'll be Continue this conversation and talk about things like memory management and how computers actually do what we command them to do. We'll talk in week five about another domain specific area forensics, the art of recovering or making sure you cannot recover sensitive information on your screen, whether it is some financial information or photos or documents or anything that you do or do not want to be recovered. In week seven, we'll be introduced more, yet more sophisticated data structures so that you're equipped to solve even more sophisticated problems. In week eight, will we transition away from C and to something more, let's say, modern, something more familiar, that of the web world? So, by the end of the semester, will you be able to make certainly your own websites, but not just with HTML and CSS, the languages with which you just make static websites? We'll talk about PHP and SQL and JavaScript so that you can actually make things more dynamic. In week nine, we'll continue that conversation as well as in week 10, but it's really in the week's problem sets. That you will dive in.、Um, in sections, we'll be this year particularly more hands on. Sections are led by our team of some 40 teaching fellows, and there'll be any number of sections that won't start until week three of the course, but more on that next week. But realize there'll be a combination of conceptual coverage as well as hands on activities with your own laptops. But the P sets themselves are what make things quite memorable. On Friday, we'll be look. At this graphical language called Scratch. And you'll program for the very first time, I bet, quite intuitively by dragging puzzle pieces, little graphics that interlock only if it makes sense to do this and then that. And you'll be able to make, in just two days, your own graphics and games and interactive art in the context of this particular cat based world. Next week, we'll be、uh, in problem set one last year. Did students then transition to that language called C and implement the basics of programming? Talking about things like loops and functions and jargon that will very quickly become familiar. But once we have just a couple weeks under our belt, can we start to play th- with things like cryptography? In week、uh, problem set two last year, did students have to write their own cipher, an algorithm that encrypted and decrypted information so that you might indeed send a secret message to someone across the room? In problem set three last year, did students implement the game of 15? This otherwise silly party favor that you might have gotten where you move those numbers up, down, left, right, but then the context of a computer. And in that week in particular, for our more comfortable students, the hacker edition challenges you not to implement this. In such a way that a human can play, but rather to implement the computer to play、uh, itself and solve this problem, no matter what the arrangement of the board is initially. In problem set four last year, did students implement Sudoku using a graphics library with which you could get colors and lines and more interesting user interfaces? In problem set five last year, did I stroll across campus and taking photos of people and places and things, and like a doofus, I accidentally formatted my digital camera's compact flash card, but never fear. I made a forensic image of my camera, whereby we then gave every one of those 494 students a file, inside of which were all of the bits, all of the zeros and ones that composed the JPEGs that I had taken of things on campus. We handed it out, and they wrote software with which to recover those photos. And for brownie points, once they had recovered those photos, they then went and recovered the people who'd been photographed. And we challenged students with a fabulous prize that if you photographed yourself with each of the faculty members who happened to be in In the otherwise deleted photos, you would win some fabulous prize. So, we had a couple of sections competing for that prize in the end. In problem set six last year, we implemented it, a spell checker, but a spell checker that was actually a bit competitive, whereby if you wanted, on an opt in basis, you could challenge the co- so called CS50 big board and run your code in such a way that we ran it through a whole bunch of tests and then reported on the course's homepage how much memory you were using and how many seconds your program took to load in 150. Thousand English words to spell check the、uh, King James Bible, the Austin Powers movie script, and a whole bunch of other sample inputs. And what was fascinating about that particular piece at that year 
is that because of this optional uh, competitive aspect, we never had people working so hard because folks would go to dinner, they'd be number two on the big board or thereabouts, they'd come back and their roommate had been toiling away, now they've been bumped down to place 10, and so this sort of social aspect there enabled people, sort of incentivized people to go back to the drawing board to outdo their roommates. In problem set seven last year, did we have students implement CS50 Finance, their own version of like an E-Trade like website that's integrated with near real-time stock quote data with Yahoo Finance so that you could buy and sell stocks and get nearly real-time stock quotes with your very own tool. Now we also ran a simulated stock competition where we gave all 500 students 10,000 virtual dollars to play with. I did not implement that big board all that well since a couple of our students uh, who are now on staff um, uh, uh, crafted out of that 10,000 virtual dollars, I think 20 billion a week or two later. So there were some holes in the system. In particular, when you use something like Yahoo Finance, which you're not paying for, when I say nearly real time, I mean there's like a five or 15 minute delay. Problem with that, of course, is that you can see the future by just watching TV, seeing what the stock price is, and you still have 15 minutes to go buy the stock that's about to go up. <laughs> so. There are some real world issues in at least our simulation there of fun. And in problem set eight last year, did we challenge students to implement CS50 Shuttle, which integrated uh, a website that students wrote with a plugin by Google called Google Earth, which allowed them to implement their own shuttle service, whereby you could take, open a web browser here, you could then go to your keyboard and start driving around campus like this. The goal being to pick up the TFs and CAs whose heads are looming large here in the distance, put them in your shuttle, and then bring them back to their particular house. So there's the in at Harvard. Let's see if we can make our way to the quad here. All right. Take a right here, a left here, shortcut through the grass. <laughs> All right, we're on Garden Street now. Registrar, and here we go, a little, little shortcut to FOHO. Okay. <laughs> and there we are at Forzheimer's house. And so that was a tool that our own students implemented last year for the climax of those, that year's problem sets. So what resources exist to empower you yourself to make sure you can succeed? No, too, in addition to sections and lectures, there are these things called walkthroughs, these optional sessions once a week that walk you through how to get started on a problem set. So that when you read these PDFs and stare at the screen and you have that very common question with any homework, my god, where do I begin? Well, these walkthroughs that are videotaped and by the staff will walk you through the process of getting started. And in terms of the community that Matt hinted at before, know that very shortly you will have swipe access to the CS50 lounge, which looks a little something like this and has such amenities as a Wii and Xbox and PS3, uh, some foosball tables there, a candy machine, and for those familiar, a cat in the ceiling. So. <laughs> Know too that the course's website will become your window into the course and rather than just put videos of lectures up there on the screen, we like to do something a little different and transcribe all of the words that might come out of my mouth so that you can search these lectures and jump around by clicking the transcripts that appear there on CS50 TV. But it's these images that you should keep in mind of the CS50 Fair and the CS50 Hackathon. The course culminates in this final project that is entirely your own to devise and when you implement your final project it will then be on display to last year some 2,000 students and faculty and staff across campus. And these are the kinds of images you saw just a moment ago. This was the CS50 Hackathon, which towards semester's end and about a week before the final project is due, we as a class will be invited to drive down in the CS50 shuttle, literally, to Microsoft's campus at NERD, N-E-R-D, which is a brilliant acronym for New England Research and Development, and spend an evening from 8 p.m. until 7 a.m. in a space that looks a little something like this. Take away today that 77% of the people around you have no prior experience and you too can accomplish the sorts of things that you've seen on display here so that your faces too will look a little something like this over the next several months. But for now, cake awaits you outside. This is CS50 and we'll see you on Friday.